Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Weisner, let, let's just look at uh, purchase options uh, for a moment. Uh, will it, if purchase options are included, uh, does that invariably drive up the monthly rental costs? Uh, I mean, does the owner exact a premium at the beginning? Uh, and would it make it more difficult for you to negotiate uh, if you were including uh, the purchase option? Sir, each, uh, each deal would need to be evaluated specifically, but it's my experience that uh, when you are negotiating in the, in the initial um, prior to award, uh, purchase options can be built into leases. Um, they are uh, a point of negotiation. We in the past have traded purchase options for free rent. We've traded purchase options for other things. So it, kind of all things being equal, it's what's important to the, to the individual that you're negotiating against, what their financial requirements are and what their institutions behind the lease want. So if they're a long-term hold uh, organization, they may not be as interested in a purchase option. If they're looking at a potential um, uh, get GSA or get the federal government as a tenant and then sell the building, a purchase option may be of no consequence to them. So every deal is specific, but my experience is that you can put purchase options on the table, yes. So it could be a useful tool. Yes, sir. And right now, uh, as I, this committee has recognized, because of the way, I mean, it, this is a little bit nonsensical. So let, let me just give a really simple, I know not realistic example. We have an operating lease for 30 years, we're gonna pay a million dollars a year, okay? $30 million outlay. Uh, we have uh, a lease, lease purchase, and let's just say it worked the same way. You're gonna pay a million a month, but at the end of 30 years, you get to purchase at a discount from the value of the property and you'd be able to continue tenancy, et cetera. Uh, but, we would, but, the, but the one with annual rent counts in this year's budget as $1 million, and the other one counts as $30 million plus the purchase price. Is that correct? Sir, scoring is not in my purview, however, yeah. I can tell you that uh, uh, there must be an evaluation of the entire deal. So when we look at, at, at the deal, it's the value of the rent and whatever the purchase option is at the end, and it could score as a capital lease for us. Right. And so what would be ideal would be we would look at all uh, the same way. We would look at the uh, obligation over time. So if we're going to rent it for a million bucks a year, we're going to say, well, it's going to cost $30 million to the taxpayers. And if we're going to rent it, you know, for less and have a lease purchase, and you say, well, gee, that's going to cost 50, except we get an asset. I mean, there's got to be a better way to do this. I mean, we, we pretty much, I think the rule was written, and maybe someone there can address it. I think the rule was written because uh, at the time, the government used to actually more regularly build, acquire property, and build structures uh, when we knew we were going to have long-term needs, because that's the most cost-effective way to go. Um, but then the lease purchase came along, which was less cost effective, obviously. Uh, and, but what happened in writing a rule to try and level the playing field, we actually put the uh, you know, lease purchase off the table, and we don't, and Congress, in its infinite wisdom, not having created capital budgets, doesn't hardly ever uh, allow the purchase of property and the building of a structure. Uh, we'd rather be idiots and uh, pay a premium and end up with nothing. Can anybody address that? No? Okay. Mr. Wise. Uh, well, I wouldn't, yeah, I don't know if I'd characterize Congress quite that way, but in any case, uh, the, the. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't call us idiots. I can call us idiots. The, so. the um, what, what happened is pretty much like what you said. It leveled the playing. It was an attempt to level the playing field, but then the it, it took away the incentives for the the lease purchases, the discount lease purchases, because as as leveling the playing field, it, it sort of eliminated those possibilities, and as a result, there was a, the, un, the you know we live in the land of unintended consequences, and one of them was then the movement towards operating leases, which only had to be accounted for, as you put it, one year at a time versus counting the totality, which put a pretty big hole in anybody's budget. Okay, so then uh, you end up with a situation and you've lost that, kind of lost that tool, and as a result, uh, you do end up in situations where you're paying rent essentially ad infinitum. I mean, we, we found cases where I think uh, one of our reports, we found there was an EPA building, EPA was renting facility in Seattle. They've been renting for 60 years, 
you know. So, uh, but our, well, our work. EPA hasn't existed quite that long. Uh, Jimmy Carter, wasn't it? EPA was. Well, it? it wasn't six years. Maybe, but, but yeah. anyways, <laughs> running a long time in Seattle. Yeah. But in any event, uh, what we found in doing the work that uh, we did for the committee this time was that uh, we examined uh, over 18,000 leases and found almost this since the early 90s, since the scoring rules came into effect, and kind of buttressing your point, we only found 17 cases where lease purchases were, were involved. And so it had effectively uh, taken away the incentive both uh, for discount and for even lease purchases themselves. So uh, it did effectively end, that, end those options, and we are left with what we have today, which is a great over-reliance on leasing and, as, as you framed it, uh, much higher costs in the long run to the government, which is something we've talked about in a lot of our reports for this committee and for others. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.